Our scripture for this morning is from James, the book of James, the third chapter, uh, verses 1 through 12. Taming the tongue. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small smart spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise the Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow, flow from the same stream, spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. This is God's word for God's people. So as we continue in our study in James today, we find James issuing both warnings and advice for us for how we should live in keeping with um, the, the scriptures we find in James. The first is a warning that many of us should not be teachers. His warning is that when you are a teacher, you will be judged more strictly. Oh, thank goodness, Pastor, I'm so glad to hear that. You know, I had been struggling to decide if I should step up and be a Sunday school teacher. Now I see it there in black and white. God is telling me I shouldn't be a teacher. Oh, what a relief. After all, why would I want to teach if I'm going to be judged more harshly than anyone else? It's best to just keep my head down and continue to plot along. Well, please do not jump to that conclusion. You see, James is not saying that no one should be a teacher. He is saying that it, uh, he is not saying this is your get out of service free card. So if you're asked to teach Sunday school, do not reference James 3 1 to me because that is not exactly what he is saying. He is simply reminding us of the responsibility that we have when we do teach. You see, when we step into a role when we are teaching others about Christ, we are to make sure we are doing our best. To follow Christ's teachings. The danger for us is when we step into those roles, if we fail in some way to live out our calling to Christ, we can hinder the growth of those that we are teaching. We become a stumbling block to those that we are teaching. Now perhaps, and I'm sure that you can, think you can think of someone that you have admired in your past, and when that person failed to live up to what you thought they were, it was probably really disappointing for you. And I know we can all think of famous pastors that have been caught up in scandal and remember how we felt when we learned of their transgressions. Uh, now imagine that they were the only connection that you had to Christ. How would that affect your faith when you see that person stumble? 
You see, there is a danger for teachers and the ones that they teach. So then how do we combat this problem? How do we make sure that we aren't setting ourselves up for this to occur as teachers and as followers of those teachers? Well, the first thing we must do is make sure we are doing our utmost to follow Christ in all that we do. The second thing we must do is that we must be honest as teachers. We have to be honest with our students. We need to make sure that they know we are not perfect. We must make sure that they know that we struggle just as they do. In a nutshell, we must make sure they know that we are also on the path following Christ, but we are not Christ ourselves. As learners, we must remind ourselves that though we may like or even love our teachers, they are still just human. They are not Christ. We must make sure that our dedication is to Jesus first before it is to our teachers. Now perhaps you are thinking, well, I'm not a teacher, so whew, I'm off the hook this week. Well, as we look at the second part of the scripture in James today, we find warnings against how we are failing to tame our tongues. And unfortunately, this is something that applies to each and every one of us. You see, try as we might, I'm sure you can think of a moment when you said something in, you, in, in your life that you have regretted. Maybe you regretted it the moment it came out of your mouth. Maybe you regretted it 10 minutes after or a day after, whatever it may be. I'm sure that you can think of a moment in your life where you spoke out in anger instead of love. And I'm sure you can think of a time when your words hurt someone else. And if you are struggling to come up with that ever happening in your life, I encourage you to look a little bit deeper. You see, this part of James is a reminder to us that we are to be using our words for good, for the good of the kingdom, and not to tear down others out of hate. James paints the wonderful picture for us, reminding us that the smallest spark can burn down an entire forest, that the largest ship needs to be moved by wind, but they are ultimately controlled by a small rudder. These writings are a reminder for us that the words that we use, they can be used for the good of the kingdom, or they can be used to hurt the kingdom. In my readings in preparation for the sermon this week, I came across a list of 10 things that are improper uses of the tongue. It was compiled by uh, Marjorie De Vega, who wrote the setup information for our study on James. And I want to talk about some of them today. We're not going to touch on all 10, but we are going to talk about some of them. The first three are lies, gossip, and insults. I feel that we can group all of these together because often they do go hand in hand. These th three things have done more to damage the relationships of others with Christ than Satan could ever hope to do on his own. When we lie, we break a core commandment, thou shalt not lie. When we gossip, we set, we allow ourselves to damage the reputation of others, and in doing so, we hinder their ability to follow Christ, and we shackle our own hearts with the heaviness of knowing what we are doing is wrong. I think gossip is one of the worst things we can do as a people following Christ. Often insults come along with gossip. Oh, did you hear about so-and-so? Yeah, oh, I heard they did this. Oh, what a bad person they are. Now that is very tame as far as an insult and gossip goes, but I'm sure you can fill the blanks in more uh, better than I can with direct quotes that you have heard. Our next one that we struggle with with our tongue is grumbling and complaining. How can we ever hope to show others the joy that comes with having Christ in our hearts if every time we walk into a room, we completely suck the air out of it with our complaining? And do not misunderstand me. There is a time for sadness. There is a time for talking through our struggles with one another, and we should be supportive of that. 
However, have you ever known a person that it seems like they could win the lottery and the only thing they would talk about is how bad it is that they've won the lottery because now they have to pay taxes on their winnings. It's like they spend their entire time looking for the tiniest flaw in anything to complain about it instead of being thankful for the Lord for all that they have. Brothers and sisters, let's not be those people. Next, we have not practicing patience with what we say. Now, this one is one that can often be tough for us. We want to react and say what is exactly on our minds. Sometimes when we're talking with someone, we are not listening to what they are saying. We are simply waiting our turn to speak. We have to be patient when we speak. If we can do that, we can help keep our emotions in check in difficult situations. And we can speak from authority instead of out of emotion. The final one that we'll talk about today is not speaking the truth in love. Now you might be thinking, isn't that the same thing as lying? Truth is the opposite of lying, right? Well, not necessarily. You see, it is entirely possible for us to speak the truth to people and do so in a way that is not loving at all. Now I have to tell you, uh, see, what we find with this is we often find ourselves in this situation, we are more concerned about being right or thinking that we are right than how the other person will take what we are saying to them. In considering this particular issue of speaking the truth in love, I was reminded of how I used to behave playing soccer when I was in high school. See, I believe I own the record for the most yellow cards in a season, uh, or a career as well, at Lewistown High School for dissent. Now, if you do not know, dissent is when you argue with the referee, and they get fed up with you, and then they give you a card. See, I had an issue with referees calling fouls or missing calls in games, and because I was sure that I knew the rules better than they did, I would make sure that I let them know when they were wrong or if they had blown a call. And I must tell you, they do not like that very much. I also must tell you that I didn't like getting carded very much, but at the time, it just seemed I couldn't get my tongue under control. Oh, I might let it go once, twice, maybe even three times in the game, but if the fourth blown call was uh, there, I was going to give that referee an earful. And what I have learned as I've grown older is this, there is almost always a way to speak truth with love. And in that example, I have learned that if I go to a referee now and simply ask them, hey, I don't quite understand why you made that call. Can you please explain it to me further? Instead of, hey, that was a terrible call. What are you watching? Their response to me is much more friendly now. And I have still made my point of asking them to think about what they have done and what they have called. You see, as Christians, we find ourselves called to speak the truth to others in love as well. The problem for us is when we allow speaking the truth to others as a moment for ourselves to become self-righteous. I want you to consider this. There is someone that you love. And they are doing something that you know God does not like. You can fill in the blank with whatever sin you would like here. How do you approach them? Do you do so in this manner? You sinner, you will surely burn in the fiery lakes of hell for your transgressions. If you don't turn away from that sin, you are doomed to an eternity in hell. I will be sitting in heaven. And you will ask me for a drop of water to quench your thirst. And I will turn away and say, I do not know you. Oh, you can approach it that way. And you may even be a little bit right. And you've probably spoken the truth here. <coughs> However, without including love and speaking the truth, you have accomplished nothing. That person will never turn away from their sins. 
and they will simp and simply because you tell them that they are sinners, they will not turn away. So what if we were to say this? Hey, I see that you're struggling with that sin. And I know that it is a hard thing to overcome. But I want you to know that God loves you and I love you as well. He wants you to turn away from those sins because he wants to have a relationship with you. You are his child and he loves you. And I would be happy to help you and to pray with you about it. And if there is anything else I can do to help you, please just let me know. Now, we are saying the same thing here, are we not? However, one is spoken from a place of self-righteousness and one is spoken from a place of love. Now, I know that there is a belief out there in our world right now that when we speak out of love, we are sugarcoating things. That we just need to speak the cold, hard truth to people. That people have gotten too soft and we should be willing to hear the truth as it is. Well, brothers and sisters, I believe that God is more interested in bringing us about change in his name than he is in us being blunt at all times. So I would simply ask you to think about this. Which is more effective, speaking in a blunt, cold, hard truth, or speaking from a place of love? So let us do our best to remember that we are supposed to do our best to control our tongues. And we must remember that they can do harm to the kingdom of God, or they can do good for the kingdom of God. But they cannot do both. As we heard in our scripture today, a grapevine cannot produce a fig, a fig, vine, a fig tree cannot produce a grape, a stream cannot produce fresh water and salt water at the same time. So we must do one or the other. Let us commit to using our tongues to do good for the kingdom of God. My challenge for you this week is really just a bonus thought. Have you used your tongue to harm someone in the past? Well, this is a good week to use it to ask for their forgiveness. Amen.